station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? And Houston, this station, we have you loud and clear. We're ready for the event. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Please stand by for opening remarks. Hello, my name is Tom Staub, President and CEO of Junior Achievement of Chicago. At Junior Achievement, we inspire and prepare young people to succeed, and there is no better inspiration than having NASA astronauts from the International Space Station answering questions from our JA students. Let's start with the first question. Hi, my name is Malaya Olivares, and my question is, what made you want to go into space? Hey, Malaya, I dreamt of traveling into space since I was a small child like you. And uh, I think it was a lot of things. I liked TV shows that talked about space travel. I liked reading books about uh, space, but also in general about adventure and exploration. I like to explore. I grew up in a little village in, in the mountains. In it's called Alps in, in Italy, and um, I liked to wander in the, in the forests and explore with, uh, with my friends, and, and uh, I got a taste for adventure and exploration. And also, growing up in a little village like that, there was very little light pollution, and so we had this beautiful night sky, and that just made me dream of traveling into space. Hi, my name is Mila. My question is, how did you train to go into space? Hey, that's a really good question. So when we get selected, uh, we have a couple years, two years of uh, very basic training uh, where we go through and we learn about robotics and we learn how to do EVAs and we learn about all the systems that are here on the space station. Uh, we also have to learn the Russian language and uh, also uh, in the U.S. we learn how to fly the uh, T-38 jet fighters uh, or uh, jet aircraft. So uh, those are all parts of the basic training and then about a year and a half before our assigned uh, to the mission and then we start doing specific training for this mission where we learn how to fly the spacecraft uh, that uh, that brought us up here in our case it was the uh, SpaceX Dragon uh, named Freedom uh, and then we also learn about specific science uh, that we'll be doing and different research that we'll be doing while we're up here on the space station. Hi my name is Raquel McCraven my question is if you didn't become an astronaut, what career would you have chosen? Hey, Raquel. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, and you know what? Um, most astronauts, I would say probably all astronauts, actually come from another career that they had to start with. So you usually don't just become an astronaut right out of school or out of college, but you have to, um, you know, get started on some other career. And so in my case, I was uh, uh, a um, pilot in the Italian Air Force. And before that, I had studied engineering. So I imagine if I had not become an astronaut, I would probably still be a pilot today. Um, or, or I don't know, or maybe I would have uh, changed my path and maybe, you know, tried to steer myself back into engineering. It's, it's really hard to say. But something like that, either aviation or some uh, engineering type uh, career. Hi, my name is Zeth Peralta. And my question is, what is the biggest surprise about not having gravity in space? Hey, Zeth, that's a really good question. Um, so for me, one of the uh, biggest surprises up here is uh, I always thought of being in zero gravity as making things so much easier to do. Uh, and, and that's true when it comes to moving big objects around because they're not heavy and you can just push them nice and easily and they just float, <laughs> just like Samantha's doing. Um, but it also makes some things harder. Uh, if you have a bag and you're trying to put something in it, uh, it doesn't stay in there because you put it in and it just wants to float out. Or if you have a very full bag and you open it, everything just comes flying out of the bag. And uh, Or if you just let something go, 
uh, and let it sit here, it'll stay there for a little while, but the air currents in the space station will then start taking it and it'll float away. And so it's very easy to lose things uh, up here too. So I was most surprised by the fact that, you know, yes, it makes some things easier, but it also makes some things harder up here. My name is Nayeli and my question is, what do you wish all people knew about space travel? You know, um, I think it would be uh, great if uh, a lot more people knew in general about the details of space travel and how it works uh, and what are the things that make it possible and what are all the jobs and professions and, and people that work in the space community to make uh, space travel possible. And I think that, you know, the reason why I want that or I would like that uh, to be the case is that I think the more people uh, get interested and knowledgeable and hopefully also excited about spaceflight, um, the more um, energies and talents uh, uh, can be um, resourced to um, improve our abilities in, in space travel so that we can go further and further into the solar system and uh, really able to exploit also the resources of uh, other celestial bodies. Hello, my name is Sofia Olivares, and my question is, how do you close in, your clothes in space protect you? Hey, Sophia. So that is, that's a good question. And so we have two basic kinds of spacesuits that we use up here. One is our launch and reentry suit. And so that's the one we travel in when we're going to and from the space station. Uh, that one serves to protect us, you know, in case there's a fire or something on, on board the spacecraft, it protects us there. Uh, and then it also provides uh, pressure in case there's a malfunction in the, uh, in the spacecraft where we start losing air, it allows us to breathe and, and um, and, and survive in that kind of situation. But then we also have uh, some suits that we go out, if we have to go outside and repair or install something on the space station, uh, these are called EVA suits or extravehicular activity suits. Um, and we call them the EMU. And the EMU is basically like our own little space suit because it, with it, we're not connected to anything and it has all the things that we need to survive. Uh, it contains all the air inside it, uh, as well as protection from things like micrometeoroids and the extreme temperatures uh, out there in space. So, uh, you know, when we're in the shadow, it gets really, really cold, uh, but the suit keeps us warm. And then when we move in the sunlight, it's really, really hot. And so that it then keeps us cool enough uh, during that. So it has to be very, uh, very flexible and very well designed. And, uh, and these suits have done an amazing job of that uh, over the years. Hello, my name is Olivia. And my question is, how do you exercise in space? And what happens to your sweat when you do exercise? Hey, Olivia. Uh, what an interesting question. You know, we exercise every single day in space. It's really, really important both to keep our, our strength, our muscles, and our endurance, but also for the health of our bones. You know, the bones are like the structure of your body. You know, it's the hard stuff in there beneath the muscles. And uh, believe it or not, it's a living tissue. It keeps being destroyed and built. And on Earth, there is a balance. You know, you destroy so much bone, you build so much bone, you keep more or less the same. Uh, but up here in space, because we are weightless, our, our muscles do not you know, do not pull and push on our bones all the time like it happens on Earth. And so our body decides, hey, we might not need all that bone, let's save. <laughs> and so we get rid of a lot of bone. And to prevent that, we work out every day. We do weightlifting and weightlessness, which sounds like wanting to, you know, have an easy win. Uh, but we have a very special machine that makes it really hard. So we can do our squats and our deadlifts and our bench presses and work real hard like we would do with weights on the ground. And we also have a treadmill to run and a bike to bike without a seat. It's a really neat bike. should look up an image. Um, and. Um, and what happens with sweat? Well, it doesn't fall down, obviously, it kind of tends to stick to your face. So you kind of have to, you know, either let it evaporate or if you sweat a lot, you might want to keep a washcloth near you and just uh, uh, wipe it off. And then we let our, you know, wet towels or washcloths, we put them near a vent so the airflow dries them and we recuperate, we recover all that water, all that moisture, and we turn it into potable water so nothing goes to waste. 
My name is Anais, and I have a question for you. If possible, would you like to live in another planet? Well, that's a good question. I, I would say I would love to go visit another planet, and I think there's a lot of things we can learn from going to other planets, uh, and I think doing science and, and just learning about those planets and how they formed and how they evolved over, uh, over you know, years and years. Uh, but I love Earth. Uh, I think Earth is the most beautiful planet. It's obviously the only one we know of that has life on it right now, uh, and it's our home. And so I would always want to come back to Earth, and it's, it's my home, and it's something that I want to make sure that uh, that we take care of and that we preserve it. My name is Chief. How is the CRISPR or Cas9 system going to affect terraforming in the future? Wow, that's a very intriguing uh, um, perspective, uh, Chief, I believe. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, in, in principle, using CRISPR, which is a gene editing tool, you could, for example, um, engineer uh, microorganism, microbes that might help you to turn uh, the atmosphere of Mars into an atmosphere that we can breathe, which is obviously not the case now. Or you could, uh, you know, engineer microbes that thrive in the Martian soil and so can help with uh, growing crops on Mars. So it's a, it's a very intriguing thought. It's obviously not an application of CRISPR that is, uh, you know, in use uh, now or in the near future. And it's, you know, it would probably need some time and some thought to fully mature. Uh, but it might be uh, something very interesting for you to pursue. Um, we actually have some uh, interesting uh, um, investigations uh, around that topic. I think Farmer has been active uh, with the Genes in Space uh, project, with uh, I understand is a student project, right? To investigate how uh, DNA can uh, repair itself when it's subject to damage due to radiation, which is uh, obviously a very hot topic for space travel as well. Hi, my name is Teresa McRaven. My question is, what is the strangest thing you've seen in space? Hey, that's a really good question. Um, so I think we get to see all kinds of beautiful things up here uh, in space. Looking out the window, uh, there's just some incredibly beautiful things as we look down at the Earth. Uh, we get to see um, the stars are just absolutely amazing. Uh, and then watching the moon as it rises and, and sets uh, over the horizon, uh, it's, it's funny because the moon almost surprises you sometimes uh, up here. But uh, you know, as far as something strange, I think one of the uh, the oddest things really is uh, the way water behaves uh, up here in space. And so, uh, I'll give you a quick little demonstration here. So when you see water, it'll just kind of free float like this, and uh, you can make these big you can make these big bubbles, and they'll uh, they'll just kind of float and hang around, and it looks like a big thing of Jello. But if it gets on something, then it makes a big old mess. <laughs> go ahead. What it does on my hand. Yep. There you go. So if you can see it on her hand, this is kind of like the sweat question we were asking earlier. It kind of sticks, uh, sticks to your skin, and it doesn't really go anywhere because there's no gravity to pull it. And so it, uh, it just kind of bobbles around in there. And so that's one of the strangest things I think that I've seen up here is the way that water behaves in zero gravity. Hi, my name's Caitlin. My question is. What do you do for entertainment in space? Kathleen, uh, what do we do for entertainment? Uh, well, first of all, as we mentioned before, we have this great view out of the window, so I think we all love to spend time at the windows uh, and also take pictures so we can share the beauty of the planet with, uh, with everyone. Um, we also like to hang out together as a crew, especially on the weekend. Uh, we, you know, we like to have very drawn-out dinners and, and spend a few hours together just, just having fun and relaxing after a, a week of uh, hard work. And uh, usually 
usually once a week we watch a movie together. Um, we have uh, part of our crew is uh, is Russian and part of our crew is uh, you know American plus me. <laughs> I'm Italian, uh, and uh, we usually alternate. One week uh, we choose the movie, and one week our Russian colleagues choose the movie. So we also have a little bit of a cultural exchange there. Hi, my name is Owen, and my question is. How big is the International Space Station? Hey, Owen. Uh, the, the International Space Station is uh, is really big. <laughs> To, uh, to answer your question bluntly. Uh, so it is basically the size of a football field. So if you've ever been to a football game and you go from one end zone all the way to the other end zone, the International Space Station would fit nicely right inside of that. Uh, and that includes all of our solar arrays and all the parts of the space station that make it work. The actual living area of the space station is a little bit smaller and it's the part right in the middle. Uh, and I've heard comparisons before that compare it to about the volume of a three bedroom house. Uh, somewhere. So uh, that's the area where we not only live, but we do, uh, we work as well. And so, uh, you know, all the things that we need to keep us alive are in there. Uh, but the space station, you know, the nice thing is we've got uh, lots of space because we're not uh, we're not just sealed to the floor with gravity. We can float up and we've got all the space that's up near the ceiling as well everywhere we go. So we've got lots of space for all seven of us to uh, spread out and make ourselves at home. Hi, my name is Eva and my question is how often do astronauts go into space? Hey, Rita. Um, it depends. I mean, we, in general, of course, we, we all spend a lot more time on the ground than, than we spend in space. Uh, and that's because, uh, as uh, you know, we heard earlier, uh, it takes a few years to prepare to go into space. Um, but also, um, you know, the, there, there are many astronauts and uh, you, you also have to wait for your, uh, for your turn to have a chance to, to fly. So I would say, you know, probably lucky people get a chance maybe every four years or so. And uh, uh, sometimes you have to wait a little bit longer. Like this is my second flight and uh, my first one was uh, seven years ago. On behalf of Junior Achievement of Chicago and our students, I want to thank our NASA astronauts for engaging with our students. We appreciate your time and your willingness to share your experiences. On behalf of all of us, we thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, my brother used to be a teacher up in the uh, Chicago area, so it's uh, really a pleasure to get to speak with you. Uh, and those were some great questions from all of those students. So uh, thank you so much for those questions. And uh, take care and Godspeed. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.